Hi, uh, thank you all for inviting me here. Uh, it's my first time in Croatia. It's been great so far. Um, I'm a meat eater, so the, the food is perfect. Uh, so today I'm going to be talking a little bit about functional programming. Uh, many of you may have heard of it, uh, maybe in the context of university or somebody was talking about Haskell at a bar or something like that. Uh, I'm going to talk about my experience uh, with functional programming and maybe how, my, how you might use it and how others are using it. Um, so, is functional programming an academic curiosity or is it industry secret weapon? Uh, so before that, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about who I am um, because, you know, I'm not from around here, you might not know me. Uh, so I'm a self-taught programmer, I've been doing it for, for a very long time, about 20 years now. Uh, I'm an open source contributor uh, for Python, I wrote the JSON library that ships with Python. Uh, I wrote a JavaScript library called MochiKit a very long time ago. Uh, I've done uh, the Mochi Web web server for, for Erlang, and I've done a little bit in the Haskell community uh, in recent years. Uh, I've been an entrepreneur on and off. Uh, I'm currently co-founder and CTO of a company called Fig. Uh, previously, most notably, uh, I was CTO and co-founder of Mochi Media. And I, I also did another, another one called Peaceable a couple years ago. I'm also an angel investor and a startup advisor. Um, and so FIG, uh, just real quick, it's a hybrid crowd investing and crowdfunding site for games. So if you're building a game and you need to raise a few million dollars and you don't want to raise it from a publisher who wants creative control like EA or Ubisoft or something like that, uh, you can go to us and then we, we can uh, help you raise that money. Uh, it launched very recently, technically not that interesting yet. Uh, I'm also working with a nonprofit called Mission Bit where we teach uh, free after-school coding classes uh, to, to local students in, in our area of San Francisco. Uh, so it, is functional programming an ac academic curiosity? Well, it, it certainly is. Uh, lots of papers have been written about functional programming. Uh, it's, many PhDs are built on functional programming. Um, so but before talking too much about that, uh, let's just talk about terms here. So imperative programming, uh, which is very much not functional programming, uh, is based on statements that change a program state. So uh, every, every line just changes the state of the program. So fu functional programming avoids changing state, and it avoids mutable data. Uh, everything is done with functions, and all the state are arguments to those functions. And so the, the important part about functional programming is, is the abstraction. Uh, of course, somewhere uh, at runtime, something is going to be mutated somewhere because you need that to, to have any effect at all. If the program is going to do something, you have some state that's going to get mutated. And that, that's just how it works. Uh, but this is a style of programming where, where you do that as little as possible. Um, but like, for example, with structured programming, you probably want to use go to as little as possible. Um, so it's, it's often easier or more efficient to use a language designed for functional programming, but it's not necessary. You can, you can do functional programming in just about any language. It's just some, some are better suited to it than others. And so, so some of the popular languages for, for functional programming, uh, you may have heard of Scala, uh, which, which runs on the Java virtual machine, or Haskell, or Clojure, um, Erlang, Camel, F Sharp, or uh, Elixir. And so, how, how is this industry secret weapon? Well, Scala's been getting a lot of use recently. Uh, Twitter basically rewrote all of their Rails code in Scala uh, for performance and maintainability reasons. LinkedIn uses it a lot, especially uh, in their data stack. Uh, Opower, Coursera, ma many companies are, are using Scala these days. Um, Haskell also has more usage than you would expect. A lot of these users don't talk too much about it because they're doing it uh, in finance and they consider it a competitive advantage. Uh, Facebook, notably, has been using a lot of Haskell uh, recently, I mean, relative to the zero Haskell they used a couple years ago. Um, uh, most notably, they're using it uh, in all of their spam detection. So on these like billions of requests they get a day, all of them are going through this Haskell system that, that processes all these business rules and decides whether or not uh, some HTTP request is considered spam or not. Uh, Microsoft also uses a lot of Haskell, but 
uh, predominantly in their, their research division. Uh, IAM View is replacing a lot of their PHP code with Haskell. Uh, Janray and Galois, there, there are a number of users of Haskell, just not super high profile users. Uh, and something I know a little more about uh, Erlang has quite a lot of usage. I mean, so, so much that I couldn't just list companies, I have to list like business sectors. Uh, so it came out of the telecom industry uh, from Ericsson. So you see a lot of usage there for uh, SMS processing, all of that sort of stuff. Uh, even even the, the switches, the hardware switches, are often controlled with Erlang. Uh, a lot of cloud providers are using it, Heroku, um, Chef, et cetera. Uh, advertising companies love it. Uh, my, my company, Mochi Media, we built our ad server uh, using Erlang. Uh, it's particularly well suited for messaging because that's basically just telecom, uh, but on the internet instead. Uh, and then you have gaming and finance and a lot of other interesting usage of, of Erlang. And it, it's turned out quite successful for a lot of these companies. Uh, notably, like Machine Zone, they're worth, uh, they were worth like three billion last year and they're doing really well. WhatsApp sold to, for 22 billion US dollars to Facebook, which is like an uncountable amount of money. Uh, you have many, many other success stories uh, TLF, CloudAnt, uh, my company, Mochi Media, we, we did quite well. Heroku uh, did fantastically. And, and even back 15 years ago, uh, some of the first Erlang success stories, like Blue Tail, they, they built this SSL accelerator uh, with, with Erlang, and that, that sold for $152 million back then. And so, you know, buy, buyer beware. Uh, using, using Erlang will, will probably not make you rich, uh, but, you know, JavaScript probably isn't doing you any favors either. So there, there are obviously some downsides to using one of these uh, niche languages. Uh, so there, there are fewer learning resources available, which, which is really the big one. And you're, you're unlikely to find a very fancy development environment, unless Emacs counts. Uh, so, so some of them have nice uh, sort of Java style IDEs, but most of them don't. Um, and there, there are fewer programmers available, uh, and it might be harder to hire. But so, sometimes you, you end up finding better programmers because the, these programming languages can be a filter. Like it, people learn these programming languages because they're very interested in programming uh, and they, they want to be experts at programming. They, they don't learn them just because they want to get a job because that, that would be a, a horrible way to do it. Uh, and there, there are fewer open, sources, open source libraries available, but you know, may, maybe you, you spend a little less time dealing with the bad ones. And there, there are some technical cons as well, like you know, nothing is perfect. So when, when you're using one of these functional programming languages, because you avoid changing state, you're constantly creating, uh, say, new objects. And so you, you put a lot of pressure on the garbage collector relative to something like C++ or Rust. Uh, but unless you're using one of those languages, th this is basically status quo anyway. If you're using a Python or Ruby or JavaScript, you're, you're really pushing that garbage collector quite a lot already. And uh, if you're doing these pure functional algorithms, uh, there, there might be some extra linear or log time cost, but there's usually some way to cheat. Uh, e either you know, there, there's some sort of back door where you can get mutability when you need it, or there, there's just a, a different algorithm that you could use or some, something you could exploit to, to have a better algorithm. Uh, and, and shared state can be cumbersome because you really avoid having global state, so you end up passing it as an argument uh, down, down the stack. Uh, but these globals are bad practice anyway. Uh, so a little bit about the history. Uh, like functional programming has been around a very long time, um, since the lambda calculus days, basically. And even before that, you know, mathematics is a lot closer to functional programming than it is to imperative programming. So you could consider it the, the oldest programming style. It just wasn't really that useful until more recently. So more, more recently, uh, you, you have um, the Erlang was in Ericsson's lab in the 80s. Uh, the, the Haskell committee was formed back then. Um, and then re really around 2000 or so, people started using this stuff. And so why, why did it take so long? Well, uh, compiling functional programming style code efficiently was a research project for a long time because it, it, it's so, so pure and, and it, it can generate so much garbage along the way. Uh, but 
the machines have gotten a lot faster and our tools have gotten a lot better. So uh, the, this is really a non-problem uh, today. And also functional programming languages just haven't had the corporate backing that, that other languages have. There, there was no sun like, you know, screaming from the hilltops that everybody should be using their thing. Uh, I mean, Ericsson could have done that, but they, they tried their hardest to kill Erlang uh, and, and switch to Java, but that, that ended up failing, so they got stuck with Erlang. So wh why, why do you care now? Well, the, the imperative languages we have are a bit of a mess. Uh, if any of you have done any programming, you, you've probably run into some of these you know, null pointer exceptions or, or problems with race conditions, whether you're using events or threads. Uh, and in, in particular, today we do a lot more in parallel than we used to. Even, even embedded devices are multi-core. My, my phone has, has two cores in it. And uh, functional programming, the, this style, can make multi-core and distributed systems just much, much easier to build. And there, there are some advantages as well. The, the code is more declarative, so you end up talking more about what to do, not, not precisely how to do it. And you can uh, let, let the compiler do the, the hard work in, in generating all of the little fiddly bits in between. And some of these languages, in particular Erlang and Haskell, have very, very cheap concurrency built in. So no, no more like event-driven callback spaghetti, not, not even promises. It's, it's much simpler than that. And uh, Erlang, in particular, was designed for uptime. Uh, from the, in the telecom industry, you don't want to drop calls. You, when you call somebody, you want it to go through. So this system was built for, for ultimate uh, uptime. Like, it, when you fail, it has to come back up immediately, and ideally not fail at all. And so a lot of the tools that you need to build these very robust, reliable systems are just built into Erlang. So uh, I'll talk a bit about that uh, soon. And so th this is a bunch of code, it's Python code, it's, it's um, a merge sort algorithm. Uh, you, you notice that, you know, I'm not gonna read any of this, it's, it's pretty long. And if we translate that almost literally to, to a more declarative language with, with pattern matching, it, it gets a bit shorter. Uh, so it might not look that much shorter, but it's actually a, a bigger font. <laughs> Uh, and so th this is the Erlang version of that code, and, and just for reference, this is what that looks like in Haskell. So, you know, roughly the same length, but maybe, maybe a little less code. So in, in these languages, ra rather than saying append this element to this list, uh, you, you just simply write a new list with that element in it. It's much more declarative. And uh, I, I'm not going to talk too, too much about this, but some of these languages, Erlang in particular, have syntax that make hard things easy. So the, these three lines of code, it parses an entire IPv4 uh, packet, including all the headers. And th this is like pages and pages and pages of C code to define all the structs and, and do all the, uh, the endian switching and all that stuff. But the, the Erlang is built for this stuff. So, and you can do this very declaratively. If you, if you want to encode a TCP packet, basically you flip uh, what's on the left side and the right side of the equal sign, and, and it just works. And so how, how cheap is this concurrency? Uh, well, when you're programming in these functional programming languages, uh, immutable data is lock-free. So the, there's no deadlocks if there are no locks at all. And uh, the per-thread cost is, is just negligible. So like less than three kilobytes per thread. Uh, and, and if you're talking very specifically about Erlang, Erlang calls threads processes, uh, which can get super confusing. Um, and these languages like Erlang and Haskell, it has high performance IO multiplexing built in. So you don't have to worry about writing your own event loop with KQ or ePoll or anything like that. It's just built in. You just call these blocking functions and it does all that behind the scenes. And because it's so cheap, you can have millions of threads. So you, you can have one thread per socket, but you, you can even have more than that. You can have a thread per state machine per socket, and, and it, it just works. And so here, here's like a quick graph of, of what that usage looks like. So uh, in, in Haskell, you can get very, very minimal uh, with, with how much a thread has in its stack uh, at less than two kilobytes. 
Erlang is less than three. By default, Go uh, is about eight, and then everything else is just orders of magnitude larger. Especially on, on Mac OS X, the default C thread stack is eight megabytes compared to like, you know, three kilobytes in, in Erlang. And Erlang is, is multi-core, so that's, that's just, you know, out of the box by default, your code just scales to multiple cores if you're using multiple processes. And the schedulers understand this. So the schedulers can have more than one thread uh, waiting on that I.O. And you just don't have to write any of that code. Uh, so the, the Erlang VM has all of these different schedulers and one, basically one scheduler per CPU. And it can migrate processes between all these schedulers. Uh, and th this is uh, sort of what typical Erlang socket code looks like. Uh, you notice there's, there's no loops here. Uh, it actually uh, recurses on itself here. So it, when it's reading HTTP headers, uh, when it gets a header, it just calls itself with, with the new data. Uh, so where we have the, the headers here, uh, name and value, and it just prepends it to that list. And then if there's, if there's a timeout, it just crashes. And that's okay because of how Erlang's built. Uh, and when, when it's done, it just calls some other function. And one of, one of the, the neat things about Erlang and what makes it so good at this sort of soft real-time use case is that it has per process heaps. So what, what that means is that your, your code that's handling that one socket, it basically has its own garbage collection. So when, when that when that process generates a lot of garbage and it needs to be cleaned up, it doesn't affect any other process in the system. And there's no more asynchronous callbacks. So not, none of that like Node.js stuff. You don't have to worry about uh, forgetting to handle the error case or, or any of that stuff. There's no inverting your code. There's no staircases. You just write code that blocks. And that's okay because you can have these millions of threads and they all just talk to each other either asynchronously or synchronously, and, and it's fine. And the, the nicest part is that errors propagate along these links. So if you have an error in one place, in one process, it propagates along uh, the other processes that own it until something handles that error. So that's very, very different than, than something like Node.js where you have an error and it just goes away if you forget to handle it somewhere, which is basically the opposite of what you want. Um, and th this is sort of what uh, the asynchronous code looks like in Erlang. Uh, the first line here, you're, you're sending a message to this counter process uh, that you want to add one to that counter, and you want the result to be sent back to self, and then you receive. You, you wait for a message from that counter process. Uh, th this, is, this is what it looks like at the lowest level. Th this is as hard as it gets, uh, building your own synchronous RPC. You, you don't actually do this, you just use libraries. So this would typically be one line and not four. Uh, and this, that's what this looks like. So when you're using the library, you just say gen server call, you give it the counter process, the message you want to send, and then you match on the result. And that, that's it. Uh, so when you're writing blocking code, it looks very simple like this. You don't have to explicitly deal with this asynchronous message passing. And the, the way you get this uptime is, is you have this let it crash mentality. So you don't, you don't try and handle every unexpected error in your application. Uh, you just let that error propagate. And you, you have this supervision tree where, where you have, at the top level, you have these very simple processes. And their only job is to, to watch to see if other processes are, are going to die. And when they die, you just restart them in whatever way makes sense. Either you kill all the children and restart them all, or or you restart just that one, or you restart that one and then everything after it, you know, whatever makes sense, you can configure it to behave in just about any way you want. Um, but handling errors that way, rather than having to put all that logic locally, uh, makes it much, much easier to build these reliable systems. And because uh, you're, you're dealing with errors here, uh, it'll handle any unexpected exception. And because these processes are, are isolated with no mutable data, you don't have to worry about some, some crazy process just corrupting your state and, and like causing a core dump or, or you know, making it such that you have to restart the whole system. 
And so that, this is basically what it looks like. So in, in Erlang, if, if this process dies for, for whatever reason, the, the supervisor is just going to restart it. And because it's a, a tree of supervisors, you can have supervisors watch supervisors. So if this supervisor dies, all of its children die because they're linked. Uh, but then supervisor A just restarts it. Uh, but of course, at, at some level, there, you don't have watchers watching all of the watchers. So you know, if you kill the root, then, then the whole thing dies. But you know, then, then you have some OS daemon to do that. Uh, but in practice, this, this doesn't actually happen because supervisors have very, very little code. And it's just library code that's been battle tested since the 80s. So uh, you don't really have to worry about supervisors dying unexpectedly. If this happens, basically the whole VM crash for some reason. And Erlang is just great to run in production. You, you can get a, an Erlang shell to any network node. Like basically you can telnet, telnet in and just start inspecting things. Uh, obviously it's not telnet, it's, it's not horribly insecure, but you know, it, it's that kind of feeling. You can just get into it and, and do whatever you need to do. Uh, whether that's replacing code or tracing things. Um, it has a lot of operational visibility as well. It supports SNMP very easily, so uh, you can put it in your monitoring system with very little effort. Uh, and one, another one of the ways that they achieve this, this really high uptime is they, they don't have to restart it. The only thing you really need to restart for is upgrading the VM. So you can upgrade services on the fly with hot code loading. Uh, and, and then, of course, the, the other way that it gets uh, this, this great uptime is that it knows that, of course, you can't have a reliable system on a single server because the hardware can fail. So Erlang has built-in distribution. So you, you can have two Erlang nodes, and they communicate with each other uh, basically seamlessly. So the, the same libraries and the same syntax for communicating amongst processes on one node, it just automatically works. Uh, if you're communicating across a network of nodes. And, and that pretty much works like this. Uh, so you can imagine that, that Alto and Onyx here are separate computers. And then you have the Alice and Bob here that are separate uh, Erlang nodes. And basically, they, they just do this sort of DNS-like handshake where these net kernels find each other. Uh, they establish a TCP connection. And then they just start sending messages to each other. And obviously, like these programming languages, uh, Erlang, Haskell, whatever, it's, it's not for everybody. Uh, no language is great at everything. Um, you, you should definitely consider a multi-language approach, though. But, but don't drive yourself totally insane by writing every little service in its own process and its own language. Uh, and of course, learning a new language, uh, it takes a lot of patience. And you're going to make mistakes. And when you do make those mistakes, uh, you should definitely rely on the internet to help you. Uh, there, there are a lot of very helpful people out there uh, on mailing lists, IRC, Twitter, Slack, Stack Overflow. All these places are just full of people ready to help you. And so like, how does this relate to the web? I, I mean, obviously, you can build back-end stuff with this, and, and many people have. Uh, but in, in JavaScript, even, you can take advantage of these functional programming techniques. And uh, recently, I, I've been using a lot of React uh, for the past year or so. And Re React is very much inspired by functional programming with this one-way data flow and having all the state in, in one place. And uh, most impressively, re rendering in React is pure. Every time you call render, you, you just return new objects every time, which makes it very easy to re reason about. And I'm not going to uh, go too deep into this because there's a React talk uh, later today or tomorrow. Um, but the React lifecycle, you render and then you, you mount, which is the process of taking this virtual DOM and making real DOM out of it. And then you have this loop where, where events happen and you update things, uh, re-render. And uh, at the end of the lifecycle of a component, you unmount it. And this, this is what a typical render function is going to look like. Uh, so it's just a, a function or, or method, more specifically, that returns some DOM. Uh, so this might look a little weird if you haven't used React, uh, because what, what the heck is that XML doing in my JavaScript? Uh, well, uh, Facebook decided that they would add a little parse transform to JavaScript, so this, this JSX transform, uh, that, that will let you write XML 
and just translate it to function calls that do the, this react.create element, uh, where the attributes uh, like class name and on click, it turns into this object, and then all the children are just uh, extra arguments to the method. Uh, and they, they actually learned this from, from what, what they do in PHP. They, they have the same system of embedding XML uh, for PHP. Uh, I forget what it's called. It's been a long time since I've worked at Facebook. Um, so uh, the, the process of mounting, you, you have some events that you can handle. A component will mount, component did mount. Uh, like I said, I'm not going to go too much into this. Um, and here, here's what a minimal example uh, of a React component looks like. So you, you have this counter here uh, where, where it has this, this state. And the, the state, it initializes it to something, like zero in this case. And then you can have event handlers, uh, which are just functions that, that deal with events the same way you would deal with them uh, if you're adding an event listener to some DOM object. Uh, you're, you're getting a synthesized event, but it behaves almost exactly like a real one. Uh, and importantly, instead of changing the state directly, you tell it how to change the state. So here I'm saying update the count to the count plus one. And to render this component, I just say that, okay, it's a div, it has an on-click handler, and uh, I'm gonna say how many times it was clicked. And then at, at the top level, somewhere like, you know, when, when the DOM is loaded, I, I call React Render uh, with the, the counter component that I've initialized here, and then I, I map it to some, some place in the DOM. And uh, it, it just, works. It's very simple. You don't have to worry about updating that one piece of DOM in place. You just re-render the whole thing. So rather than having two paths of code to test, you just have one, uh, just one render function. And what React will do is it will see that, that only that count changed, and it will only update that part of the DOM. Even though every render, you're, you're creating this whole tree of, of what it should look like, it, it will just do the difference and, and only change that little bit. So it's actually quite performant, even though it looks like it might be slow, re-rendering the page every time. Well, that, that's not what actually happens. And so using these functional programming techniques, like well, what does that actually make easier? Well, uh, so, some things become very easy. So if you want to implement undo or redo, any sort of like time travel, git branching, that, those sorts of operations, it becomes very easy because you're not mutating the state directly. You're, you're creating new state every time. So if you want undo, you can just save the old state. I mean, uh, obviously there, there are some uh, performance considerations to take into account, but uh, just sort of prototyping it is very, very simple. And the, the other thing uh, that, that's really helped me out a lot is that everything becomes very reproducible and very testable, and you don't have to rely on mocking to, to sort of approximate how things behave because there, there aren't all of these implicit connections between things. Everything is one, one way. It flows from the top down. So if you want to test uh, the bottom, you, you only have to instantiate that part, and you can test it in isolation without having to mock anything. And when, when these libraries are written properly, you can actually get very, very good performance with very simple code. Uh, for example, Re React only re-renders what, what is changed, and it can do so efficiently. Uh, and if you're looking at these slides later, there, I put in a whole bunch of resources uh, to learn more about uh, Erlang and Haskell and uh, functional programming in JavaScript, some of the libraries that I've used and, and I like. Um, and there's a whole, a whole ecosystem of functional programming languages that compile to JavaScript that are all very interesting. Uh, and there's some more, some more reading about uh, functional programming that, that I would recommend if you're interested. And so I, I think I have plenty of time for questions here. I didn't know what you all wanted to see, so I left uh, some time here. Um, so please feel free to ask questions about anything, whether it's functional programming or, or uh, being an entrepreneur or any of those things, it's fine. Uh, thank you.
Okay, so the, the question was, is there any reason uh, for a startup to use a functional programming language rather than something like Ruby where things can be done very fast? Uh, so the, the answer to that is complicated. Uh, so in, in, some, in some cases, it can be faster to do what you're doing with a functional programming language uh, if you choose the right one and it has the right libraries. Um, and some of the other ways that a functional programming language can benefit a startup is it, in, in some cases, it can be easier to recruit very, very talented people. Because some of these very talented people would rather program in Haskell than Ruby. So, and, and there are fewer opportunities for them to really uh, use Haskell at work. So, uh, so some startups ha have very successfully recruited top-notch people just because of the languages that they choose, whether that's PureScript or Haskell or Clojure or whatever. Uh, so it, it can be a hiring advantage. Uh, but uh, of course, like if you're very good at Ruby and you can do it very quickly and, and you don't have any of these uh, performance or scalability concerns, then, then uh, absolutely use Ruby. Uh, but you, you should consider using functional programming techniques uh, to make that Ruby code easily testable. Uh, and in particular, if you have a front end, uh, the JavaScript code gets much, much easier to deal with uh, if you're using it in a functional style. Okay, so the, the question was, uh, we, we've heard a lot about uh, when functional programming is good, uh, but a bit less about when, when it isn't. So when, when shouldn't you use functional programming? Um, so in, in, in my experience, uh, you, you can sort of shoehorn functional programming into just about anything. <laughs> so so there, there are a lot of, a lot of cases where, where it can work, but in, in some cases, it can be better to, to use an imperative language, uh, in, in particular when, when what you're doing is truly imperative. If it's very, very simple and imperative and, and you're interfacing with, with something very imperative, it, it, it can be easier to do that. Uh, in, in some cases, uh, for performance reasons, uh, you might want to uh, use an imperative language or, or an imperative style. Uh, in particular, uh, if you're going very, very low level uh, and you're, you're very concerned about uh, memory allocation or, or something like that, then, then essentially you, you have to program in uh, an imperative style. Uh, like if you're writing an interrupt handler, you can't allocate memory. So you, you really need to, to ensure that what it, whatever it is is, uh, is imperative in, in that way, that it doesn't need to allocate anything new. Uh, and uh, of course, the, the biggest reason not to use functional programming is that there's no library available for what you want to do in a functional programming style. Uh, for example, if I'm, if I'm building, let's say, fancy charts in JavaScript, I, I don't have a good functional programming uh, style library to do that with, so I'll just use D3, right? So it's, it's very, very pragmatic when, when to not use functional programming because uh, the, the imperative library out there is, is good enough and, and performant enough and, and it exists uh, and it saves you a lot of time relative to writing your own that, that you have to maintain forever. Uh, so so I, I think, you know, in, in theory, functional programming works everywhere. In, in practice, uh, it only works when, when somebody really took the effort to make it work. Hello, I'm Fosna. Uh, I wanted to ask you, did you start programming in, in uh, Erlang, functional languages, or did you start with Java or something like that, which is imperative? Okay, so uh, when, when I started programming, um, I, I was about nine years old, and, and uh, I, I programmed in like ROM basic, so, so when your computer starts up, 
back then, if you didn't have a disk in, it would just you know, be a basic prompt. So that, that was my first programming experience, very, very imperative, uh, no, not even OO. Um, after that, I, I learned uh, Pascal and, uh, and x86 assembly because I had a PC and I wanted to do fast graphic stuff. And I learned many other languages since then, C and Perl and JavaScript. I, I really didn't get into functional programming uh, until uh, about eight years ago uh, when, when I was uh, building Mochi Media. Um, so pr prior, prior to that, my only functional programming experience was the stuff built into Python, like list comprehensions, map, filter, those kinds of things. Um, but when, when I was building Mochi Media, I, I knew that uh, programming uh, network code in Python uh, w was really kind of a pain in the butt uh, with Twisted or, or whatever. Uh, and I knew that I needed to build something very efficient. And I, I knew that there had to be a better way. So, so I did a lot of research, and I came across a couple different libraries and languages, uh, like the various things in C++ and, and what have you. Uh, and along the way, I found Erlang, and I tried it. And my prototype in Erlang uh, was about the same length of code as Python, but it performed two orders of magnitude faster. Uh, with less memory, uh, so I just kept going with Erlang after that, and I, I really um, got into functional programming because Erlang was was so well suited to the problems I was trying to solve. Uh, so I, I learned it uh, at work, uh, and it, it, it was very very far from my first programming language. Do you hear me? <laughs> okay. Uh, there is an after question. Now you teach people how to code after work, right? Uh, do you teach them functional or imperative? And why not functional? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that, that, that is a great assumption there that I'm not teaching them functional programming, uh, which is true. So the, the, the class that I'm teaching is primarily about introducing students to programming. Um, so we, we actually spend a lot of time in, in HTML and CSS um, because th these are the technologies that they're using like every day. Like they're, they're very familiar with a web browser. Uh, and I, I like teaching them these languages because these are the languages that they see if they right click and view source. So I'm kind of teaching them like the native language of, of the platform that they use. So. Uh, I, I prefer not to start with functional programming uh, for, for that reason, because I, I just want to expose them to, to sort of how it works, and, and I want to give them that, that understanding that when they look under the covers, they, they can follow it and see how it works. If, if I was teaching a course more about um, the theory of programming, like data structures, algorithms, stuff like that, then, then I, I would absolutely consider doing it in a functional programming language. Um, the, the, other, the other reason uh, why I haven't done it in a functional programming language is that I haven't found one that, that is really that friendly uh, for beginners, that, that works well on computers that you have very little control over. Uh, so what, one of the things that, that's, that was important to me was that um, the, the requirements to set up a programming environment be very, very small, so that if they, if they want to learn more at home or like in a library or something, they can just load up Chrome and, and you know, some, some online editor like Cloud9 or something like that, and then just you know, learn more on their own. I didn't want them to only be able to program in this, this sort of pristine environment that, that, is, that only exists uh, in our classroom. Uh, so th those are... The, those are sort of the, the practical reasons uh, why, why I haven't uh, done the functional programming stuff uh, with, with young students. Um, in, in the future, when, when there are good self-hosting JavaScript-based functional programming languages, uh, like very recently, uh, ClojureScript has, has become self-hosting. So you can actually run the ClojureScript compiler entirely in the browser without needing a server-side component. You know, may, maybe in a year or two, it would make sense to have 
like an, an online IDE that's, that's basically all client side where you can use a functional programming language in the browser w without having to install stuff. Uh, I, I think that, that maybe in, in two years or so, it would make sense to have that kind of environment available for students, uh, but it, it's just not practical yet. And I don't have the, the time uh, to build that kind of thing myself. Okay, thank you. It sounds like we have another project to do. <laughs> Hello. Uh, could you please uh, compare and contrast using um, Erlang and Haskell to using Go? Because they, they mostly solve the same kinds of problems. So what are your thoughts on that? OK. Um, so so the, the big differences uh, between Erlang and Haskell are that, that Haskell, Haskell allows much more uh, sort of freedom of, of what you can do. Uh, it, it, it might not be obvious, but, but Haskell allows you to do basically anything you want to do. If you want to do mutability, you can do that. Like there, there are these, uh, there's the IO monad, and, and you can do whatever you want in the IO monad. Um, uh, and, and so Haskell is basically an unrestricted general purpose programming environment, um, wh which has pluses and minuses. But Erlang is, is actually much stricter in the sense that, that it, you, you can't do that. Like just about everything in, in Erlang other than message passing is purely functional. So if you're doing something that, that requires a lot of mutability for performance reasons or, or whatever, uh, Haskell is the better choice. Uh, because if you're, if you're doing that kind of thing in, in Erlang and you need to make it very fast, then what you actually have to do is you have to uh, write a a uh, native function in Rust or C or something like that to, to do that mutability because Erlang just doesn't give you that flexibility. Um, but on the flip side, Erlang is much, much easier uh, from an operational perspective. Um, once a Haskell program is running, you, you have very little idea of, of what it's doing because it's just basically machine language at that point. Uh, so unless you build in instrumentation, it's just a black box. But, but Erlang, uh, you can, because it's bytecode and because the system is designed for this, you can add tracing, you can, you can replace code. You, you have a lot of flexibility over what you can do at runtime with Erlang. Um, like you can't do hot code loading in Haskell reasonably. I mean, th there are people that are, that are doing it, but it's, it's not something that's easy to do. Uh, and, uh, so, so Erlang is, is just much simpler to run in production uh, if your problem is suitable uh, for the Erlang programming model. Um, but if it isn't, then, then Haskell may be a very good choice. Or if performance is, is your number one concern, then, then Haskell is most likely a better choice than Erlang. Uh, because Erlang is generally uh, interpreted by code. Uh, rather than compiled machine code. There, there is a JIT, but, but not everybody uses it, and there's some downsides, yada, yada, yada. But uh, Haskell is, is very, very fast. So if, if you're concerned about performance, then, then Haskell might be the best choice. Or if you're concerned about uh, code maintainability, because Haskell uh, has these static types, um, it, it may be the better choice. Uh, as far as Go uh, is concerned, um, Go is very, very difficult uh, to write generic code, um, at least w without uh, driving yourself crazy and, and uh, essentially doing object casting between interfaces. Um, and the, the, the way that, that concurrency is modeled in Go, like the, the errors don't propagate in the same way that they do in Erlang. And you, you have to explicitly handle errors everywhere uh, so essentially, what Go feels to me, it's like the, the worst parts about programming in JavaScript and the best parts about like, the concurrency model of Erlang and somehow you put those together. Uh, it, it doesn't make as much sense to me. Um, 
But uh, I mean, obviously, people use Go successfully in production, so it's it's not a horrible language, uh, and it, you know, it it may very well be better at the, those sorts of problems than say Python or Ruby. But um, I, it's other than having cheap concurrency, there there really is no comparison between Go and Erlang or Go and Haskell. They're they're just fundamentally different kinds of languages. Um, hi. So my question is, um, what, are the, what is the biggest challenge that you faced with functional programming? And were there any moments where you would say something like, oh my god, I wish this was Java or C or something like that? Uh, let's see. So, so the, probably the, the biggest challenges uh, that, that, that I faced were were not programming challenges. They, they were um, sort of management challenges. Uh, ba back then, uh, you had to sort of constantly justify, like, why, why are you doing this? Why are you not just using Java? Why are you not just using whatever? Uh, because it, you know, it seemed like a weird choice. And, and people were concerned that, oh, you, you know, nobody uses this, so how are you going to hire people? And you know, those, those sorts of challenges were, were really the, the, the hardest challenges that, that I, I had faced. I, I mean, obviously, we had something that, that worked very well. And we had a, a small team that was able to maintain it. Uh, and we were able to run it on very few servers relative to the competition. So uh, o over time, it, I had to prove it less and less. But in the beginning, uh, it, it was uh, a bit of an uphill battle. Um, as far as technical challenges go, uh, the, the hardest thing uh, that, that we had to deal with uh, was essentially memory fragmentation, um, which, which you run into in just about any language. But it, it can be quite difficult to, to debug uh, because there are no live objects referencing that memory that, that's unusable. It's just fragmented. Uh, and the, the only solution there is to, to sort of fundamentally change like when or, and how you use uh, memory. Um, but you know, fortunately, the, this, these weren't crippling problems for us. Uh, they, they were just very challenging to diagnose and, and to debug and work around. Hiya, uh, and what do you think about Elixir? Because uh, it's perceived by many as a next big language for the web. OK, um, so I think Elixir is, is uh, great because it, it has uh, a number of features that, that I feel like Erlang would be much better off uh, if it had. Uh, and because, because it was. Um, Thank you. Because it was much more recently uh, invented, uh, it, it has, in, in some ways, fewer mistakes than, than Erlang has. Uh, but I, I think that, uh, personally speaking, uh, Elixir makes some of the wrong trade-offs uh, with, with regard to syntax. Um, like, I, Although I write a lot of Ruby code today, I, I'm not that fond of the syntax. Uh, and Elixir takes most of its syntax from, from how Ruby works. Uh, and in particular, one, one of the things that, that uh, feels very wrong to me when I'm using Elixir is that uh, pattern matching isn't the default. You, you have to ask for pattern matching. Uh, where, uh, and uh, variables are no longer a single assignment. So, so when you're coding in Elixir, it almost feels like you're using an imperative language because it behaves as imperative languages do, where you can just, you know, reassign variables all you want, um, and and you have uh, the, these very Ruby-like things. Uh, so it, it feels very unnatural to me. Uh, but uh, I, I think that it it's certainly a very interesting alternative to to something like Ruby. Uh, but I, I don't think that. It will, it will ever win over uh, the subset of the airline community that, that really likes airline for what it is. Uh, 
I think it's, it's really just almost an entirely separate community uh, of people that, that want the features that, that the Erlang VM has, uh, but they, they really enjoy programming in Ruby. Uh, so I think, you know, it's a great thing, but I don't think it's for everybody. Uh, hello. Uh, what are your, your, your thoughts on uh, Twitter and returning to the Ruby code like it was, but now using 2.2 and Rails 4.2? Would the performance um, results be the same or be better? Thanks. Uh, so I, I am, even though I've been using Ruby for almost two months now, I am not a Ruby expert, so I, I really can't tell you too much uh, about you know how rail, how slow Rails used to be and, and how much better it is now. Uh, but I, I can tell you that that in my limited experience with Ruby, that that it is and current versions of Ruby at that, it it is not a a very fast language, and a lot of the uh, a lot of the techniques that, that are used in, in Rails in particular uh, don't seem like they would be very fast uh, as far as linear performance goes. Uh, and, and those are the sorts of things that, that uh, Twitter cares about now because um, when, when you have that many servers, like, you know, the, the cost of using Ruby, you, it, it ends up being like in the, the amount of servers you have to buy and, and the the amount of, of power that you have to buy to run those servers. Uh, so I, I'm sure that, that if they rewrote Twitter in Ruby, they, they would have made uh, much fewer mistakes and, and the newer versions of Ruby and newer versions of Rails have, have fixed a lot of those uh, uh, mistakes that, that made it impossible to write uh, very efficient uh, code, but uh, ultimately, the, the JVM and Scala are, are just better at doing a lot of the things that they want to do. Um, like, you know, re rendering pages uh, requires a lot of uh, sort of sequential execution uh, from the Ruby interpreter. Like, in, in my experience, rendering pages in Ruby, it, like, it dominates runtime. Like it's way more than any database calls or anything else. Uh, and, and that's almost all of what Twitter is doing. It's pulling things from cache and just rendering it. Uh, so I, I'm not sure that, that it would be compelling uh, for them to, to switch, uh, especially because now they have such a bad taste in their mouths uh, from, from you know, having Ruby problems for so many years and having gotten rid of all of it. I, I can't imagine them uh, going back. Hello. Uh, what would be your, if you would like to geek out and make like a purely functional web app, what would be your go-to stack? Um, so that, that's, that's a great question and, and I, I think it really depends on what exactly I, I am doing. Um, so. If, if I was going to focus mostly on the front end, uh, I, I might look at uh, Clojure and Clojure Script uh, because they're, they're very, very close and there, there's a, a pretty good community around that. Uh, if I was going to build something uh, like a messaging platform or, or something that, that needed the kind of um, the kind of things that Erlang is good at, then I would definitely use that on the back end because I know it very well and, and the, the libraries and ecosystem uh, makes that uh, a great choice. Um, if I really cared about sequential performance or uh, if I was doing something that Haskell had very good libraries for, I would use Haskell. I mean, ultimately, I don't, I don't have a go-to stack uh, for, for functional programming in the way that, 
say, if I was using Python, I might use Rails, or if I was using uh, Ruby, uh, or if I was using Python, I might use Django, if I was using Ruby, I might use Rails. There, there's no obvious uh, sort of functional programming framework uh, in, in my mind, uh, unless you're committed to, say, Clojure or Scala. There, there are pretty obvious choices there, but um, choosing between the, the languages is, is uh, not obvious because they're, they all are good and bad at, at various things. Uh, and it really depends on what you're doing and, and what libraries you want to use. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, so you talked a lot about uh, Erlang and Haskell. Now on the other side we have uh, Clojure and Scala which are running on top of uh, JVM, which is basically not originally invented for functional programming, right? And then you also advised using, using functional styles such as immutable JS or maybe using just the functional style in Ruby. So the question is, how well uh, does functional programming perform on platforms or runtimes or virtual machines which are not basically invented for functional programming? So there, there's no sort of general metric to describe how these languages uh, perform. Um, in, in practice, uh, Scala and Clojure uh, essentially have very, very similar to native Java performance. Uh, so, sometimes better because you, you can use uh, different approaches, um, at least with regard to lines of code in, in Clojure and lines of code in Java. You can, you can often get better performance for less code. Um, the, the JVM is, it turns out to be quite good uh, at, at a lot of these things, um, just because uh, the, the ways people have used Java over the years, uh, the garbage collectors are already very used to dealing with lots of garbage, so uh, that, that part of the equation is, is more or less solved. Um, the, the parts that, that are uh, less conducive to functional programming are, are probably more along the lines of um, the, the way the stack works, uh, but clo Clojure sort of ignores that problem entirely uh, and, and forces you to use um, a different form if you want to have tail recursion. Uh, and Scala has just a very sophisticated and slow compiler that, that deals with that. Um, so so on, on the JVM side, I, I don't think performance is a problem. It's comparable to native Java for, for the most part. Uh, if you're if you're writing <coughs> sort of low-level code, I mean, obviously, if you're using too many abstractions and the compiler doesn't get rid of them, then then the code can be much slower. But that's no different than than regular Java. Uh, as far as JavaScript goes, uh, the the libraries that I've used uh, seem to be quite good. Um, like Immutable JS in particular, uh, Mori is also good uh, for for the data structures. Um, I mean, they're, they're within a constant factor of performance of the, the built-in uh, objects, but there, there is overhead, of course. Uh, but there would be more overhead if you were just, say, using uh, JavaScript objects and then uh, copying them uh, to get that immutability. So the, these data structures with, with um, their hash array, uh, mapped tree uh, internals uh, tend, tend to work very well. Uh, on, on both the, the JavaScript and Java virtual machines. Um, so in, in practice, it, it, it really hasn't been a, a problem, at least for me. <laughs>